Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Jacqueline Hudson, and I am the Expo Expositions Content Developer here at the uh, National Underground Railroad Freedom Center here in Cincinnati. And we are here for the Ask the Curated Artist event with a discussion with the Designing Justice, uh, an artist and curator, Luba Lakuma. So I'm going to start with, um, with her short bio. So New York based Luba Lakuva creates striking images that have been exhibited worldwide. Passionate and bold, her messages reflect the human condition, fundamental fairness and justice. Her work is included in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, New York, Denver Art Museum, French National Library, Paris, Hong Kong Heritage Museum, the Library of Congress, and the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Her solo expositions include Encico, Paris, France, DD Gallery, Osaka, Japan, La Mama Gallery in New York, Art Institute of Boston, Museum of Design, Atlanta, and Jewish Museum, Milwaukee. Lakova has Lakova has received commissions from Sony Music, Canon, the New York Times, Time, and Harvard University, among others. So I would love to uh, welcome our artist and curator for the Designing Justice exhibit, Luba Lakova. Hi, Luba, how are you? I'm good. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you all uh, for coming to our meeting um, tonight. Um, uh, first, uh, thank you for the introduction, Jackie, and uh, I would like also to um, express my heartfelt thanks to the entire Freedom Center in Cincinnati for hosting the exhibition during this pandemic. Uh, we made this uh, large show possible, uh, so I'm really grateful for, for all your help. Um, and I would like to especially thank uh, um, Director of Museum Experience, Katie Bramel, and um, um, uh, Chief Operating Officer, or the Director of the Freedom Center, uh, Woody Kian, for, for your hospitality, for giving me this fantastic opportunity to share my work with the community in Cincinnati and for all visitors and guests who have visited the museum for this already five months. So we are now in the final month in, in March and uh, um, I never imagined that when we opened the exhibit in October, yes, the situation wasn't perfect. The pandemic was uh, still very strong in, in the US and we all you know, were stressed, but what's happening now in these last couple of days uh, is just unbelievable. And uh, uh, when I look back and see all the works in this exhibition, unfortunately, many of them are still so relevant to what's happening now. So yes, um, come and visit the show if you are in the area, maybe you will find answers to some of the questions that we are all asking about what's happening in this world and how we in our small way, both as citizens, as teachers, as artists, as whatever our purpose in society is, how we can make something so, so there is a positive change so, so we can live in peace and prosperity instead of these horrible events that we're witnessing now. Mm, so, so yes, um, Jack, I'll be happy to answer your questions and I will share my screen and show pictures uh, so you can guys see maybe a few um, photos from the, from the gallery, from the display that we have at the Freedom Center, but also individual works. And after that, I'll be happy to answer your questions. So, so yeah. Mm. Well, 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 thank you, Luba. Um, you know, for someone who was um, involved in the installation of your you know, very striking exhibit. Um, it definitely um, uh, elicited, not elicit, but, you know, um, informed conversations about different subjects um, that I never thought of or, or actually looking at a new way of looking at these um, different subjects that you express in your exhibit. So, so let's get this, let's get this, um, let's get this started. Okay. So let's start with, so let's start with the beginning. Uh -huh. let, let me just give me a sec. Let me just share my screen. 
Sure. Um, um, oh, 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 sorry, I pressed and press. Sorry, I said press live meetings. <laughs> okay. Uh, share. And um, yeah. So I hope you see it full screen now, right? Or no? Yes. You okay. Do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, please uh, tell me what, what do you want to ask me? Yes. Yeah, so, the, so let's start with the beginning. When did you begin to create your art? Mm. Yeah, well, I like um, almost every child I know, I started drawing and making all kind of uh, doodles and, and things. Uh, and that was my favorite thing to do as a kid, because also my, my grandmother was a visual artist and I grew up around her. Mm. So I just never imagined myself doing anything else. And uh, as you can see, first of all, this is a uh, a view from the entrance of our exhibition at the Freedom Center. And the symbol of this exhibition is a pencil and the two hands like a fire, making the pencil a fire stick. But the pencil is the very first tool that every child starts to, to play with, to make marks, to make uh, lines. And that was for me, right? But in my practice now as a professional artist, I still um use that and always this creative process for me begins with drawing you see so so basically i started drawing as a kid and um, through my entire school years i went from one art class to another after school trying to 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 start drawing and painting better and better and eventually i graduated from the Academy of Fine Art in Bulgaria, where I'm originally from, and I became a professional artist. But in the beginning of everything is really the pure drawing. When you learn how to make images from your imagination, first drawing from nature, you know, all kinds of exercises over the years. I cannot even tell how many art classes and how many years I've spent learning this craft. So there is now probably a specific moment that I could recall. Everything for me has been associated with that, with making images. Um, that is, that's at least in the beginning when you just want to learn the craft. At some point when you feel already that you know how to speak with, with these pictures, then you start to think how you, what you communicate and how you um, address the audience of the people who see it and what you want to tell them and how you want them to feel so but but this is all part of you know growing as a professional and that's the process for me that's another view from the entrance of the exhibition and i will tell you a little bit more about some of these images yeah so i guess that's that's the answer i started as a very young kid and i never imagined doing anything else in my life yeah i love that you um you know you know, connected the art with your family. So I think that's, that's, that's very important. And I think that's kind of like, you know, doing, you know, that's a, that's a drive of, you know, a force for you is, is, you know, connecting with your family. So I think that's that a great, true. yeah, that's a great way to, you know, uh, yes. hone your, hone your art. Yeah. Very true. Because also it's not easy to be an artist, like not, not, no job is easy, but being an artist sometimes can be very, you know, discouraging in moments. And when I think about this nurturing environment that I had from, from someone who was an artist professionally, that really gave me strength. Yeah. That's, that's very good point that the family connection is very important. Yeah. Right. For sure. Yeah. Was this something you've always wanted to do? Yeah, I always wanted to do that. Uh, again, back to my family, my parents, uh, they, like every parent probably, for them being an artist is something that is not very um, solid profession, or maybe they just feel that you could do something better where, where you feel safe in life. So my parents wanted me to have a different path, but I prevailed and... Um, yeah, I always wanted to be that. But like I said, it wasn't easy. But I went through many, many, some smaller, some bigger obstacles and kind of prevailed and found my path, you know, and, and doing what I'm doing, you know. So that's the only thing I do. And I've never done anything else. So. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's great. You know, you're definitely one of the few um, individuals that I know that, that started out with something to continue, you know, after all these years. So that's yeah. that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, so 
what specific moment or event inspired you to pursue this venture? Well, um, look, uh, the, I'm not sure, again, about the specific moment, but at some point um, where I was uh, graduating already from school, and um, it was a different time that probably when I was gra graduated from school, you can imagine what's happening now in Ukraine for a young student who graduates now and it's a situation of war. When I was graduating, that's exactly when this uh, communist system collapsed. And just a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, second thought, when I first came to uh, see the Freedom Center last summer, uh, just to see the gallery because with uh, Katie, we already had uh, decided that the exhibition is gonna happen and all that. I was really struck to see that there was a piece of the Berlin wall in front of the Freedom Center because when I was a young kid, just graduating from, from school, that's when the, uh, the Berlin wall fell. And I would never imagine that 30 years later, I will be in the US, in oh, Cincinnati, Ohio, <laughs> in the gallery, that in front of it has a real piece of the Berlin Wall because I never saw the Berlin Wall uh, for real in my life. I, I was never in, in Berlin, in Germany. I saw it for the first time in, in the US. And look where we are now, five months after the opening of the exhibition, uh, that communist empire, evil empire strikes again, you know, so it's, it's just unbelievable what's happening. But, but um, yeah, so, so anyway, when I graduated from, from school, I thought that I will use my skill to tell, to say something meaningful. Okay. And here that's another um, wall from the Freedom Center, but you see in the exhibition, we have a lot of this, we have like four, panels with these sketches that can give you an idea of all of these little drawings that I make be before I come up with an idea. And here, this image talks about this balance that we have and how instead of that, we should create beauty and music. And in my work, I play a lot with visual metaphors. So in this case, the gun kind of resembles to me the hand of a harmonica player. So that's, that, that's this picture. But probably a um, moment that I would say Mm. defined what I want to do is really to, to tell stories with my pictures and to engage people in this, uh, in, with the images. This is another one that um, we have in the exhibition. It's called Delta Blues. And you see here, again, that visual metaphor or the positive negative, the beauty of the music comes from the struggle of this painful history that we have um, in, in the US about the American South and the slavery and how from this pain came something very beautiful that the entire world loves because the, the music uh, that came from America, from the, the black musicians from the South, that's like the biggest to me cultural contribution, if you like, from, from our country to the world, because I don't know anybody who doesn't love that music and who is not moved by it. But the story comes that this beautiful sound and the content of the lyrics come from very difficult circumstances and a lot of pain. So, so that's what this image is all about. And uh, yeah, another one from our exhibition, so basically I'm showing with these pictures to, sh to say that with every image I'm trying to tell something, to tell a little story perhaps, you know. This one is about um, Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, his message, his dream that he offered to us and the response to it was unfortunately very cruel and he lost his wife, life and um, um, his peaceful message was greeted with violence in a way. So, um, yeah, uh, all of these images in the exhibition are kind of inspired by this idea that I had as a very young person that my images, they, if I, I can, I could make them as beautiful as I want, you know, but they have to have a message that, um, stays in people's mind and hopefully inspires them to do something good, to be a force for good in a way, yeah.
Right. And yeah. I know we're going to talk about this, you know, very shortly, but, you know, since you still have this image up and we talked about this, you know, last week about like, I really love this image is because, um, you know, the, the, the man and, you know, man in the, in the chair represents, you know, Martin Luther King and, you know, basically delivering that I dr- have a dream speech, but then what I spoke, you know, spoke to you um, last week about, you know, the, the dogs there, but you don't know who's holding, you know, holding the, the, the leash. It could be oh. the police. It could be white supremacists. It could be, yeah. you know, it could, whoever, you know, I, I like that. Well, you know, for me, it's like everybody has, maybe everybody has their interpretation of who's holding the, you know, holding the dogs back. So I, I definitely, that's one of my favorite pieces from, from your, oh. you know, from the exhibit. So I like that it, you know, and a lot of your other, um, pictures I mean your your images as well is that it definitely um it it starts you know definitely would spark a conversation but then everybody has their own interpretation of you know of social social security or brainwashing or you know delta blues and I and I love that the the contrast between on the delta blues one is that you know the 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 cotton the you know the and then the you know the the gentleman playing the harmonica so it's like a I love the just just a positions of the different types of images that you incorporate in your work so I love that no thank you but thank you so much but yes you are right about this uh, who is controlling the dogs and in my one of my sketches I had drawn some hands but then I felt that they just don't add anything to the picture because you see that this uh, um mm, leashes are uh, tight so obviously some but someone is controlling them and pulling them but yes it's open for for interpretation or somehow also kind of has a message because racism and all these negative things that we see in our society, they sometimes are invisible. They don't demonstrate themselves straightforward. You can, you know, feel them, but you cannot see from where they come sometimes, you know? Right, right. So so that's also one um, subtle element of, of that you know if you like yeah yeah Mm. right so so I'm gonna back up just a tad bit um about your uh training so um and we'll we'll go definitely go back into the more complex um social issues that you address in your Mm -hmm, work mm -hmm. but did so my next question for you is did you teach yourself or did you have formal training briefly walk us through that process yes so um, I did I do have formal training so after uh, you know, I graduated from high school. Um, I, you know, knew that if I want to be an artist, I had to go to, to a college for art. And back then in Bulgaria, there was only one main um, art school. And uh, you had to have a diploma from this school if you want to practice professionally. That's how it was. You know, it's almost like a license. And it was very, very difficult to be accepted to be a student because that was the only higher visual art education. So I had to apply three years until I was accepted. I I just did not qualify, I suppose, I don't know. Um, And uh, the first time I applied, um, I also applied for engineering because in my family my dad was an engineer and I was good at math and I was accepted there you know to you know my huge disappointment I was accepted to study that but not the arts you know on the other hand my parents were very very happy that oh you're gonna have a good job so I studied for one year engineering and then I just said I cannot do that I can just I cannot do that and I went back home and applied one more year and another year and finally I was accepted so then after that followed six years of very intense art training drawing painting all kinds of art medium and techniques and everything which which was great you know it was just drawing and painting and just being involved with with that so after this program um, I started also working when I was still in school um, some small jobs that I could find. But after that, I went and worked for a very short time in a theater company as a theater designer. And then uh, that was exactly the time when I told you that whole communist system collapsed. 
and the society kind of opened up and I received this invitation to participate in an exhibition in Fort Collins, Colorado. And uh, I went there, I showed some of my work in that exhibition. And then on my way back, I stopped in New York and without planning or making any imagining that this would be possible, I um, showed my portfolio at the New York Times and they hired me to do drawings. And uh, for them, it wasn't a problem to work with a foreigner like me. So, um, and I had this visa that allowed me to stay for, for six months, but less than a month in, in, uh, in this country, I was working, you know, and that at that time was, uh, that was a long time ago, you know, that's 30 years ago. At that time, because of that, I was able to, to get a green card and eventually to become an American citizen. So basically, all my life has been defined in a way by the fact that I was an artist, you know, <laughs> because I started with some very small projects and very small jobs, but eventually it built up to, to something bigger. But for me, there is never a big or small job, you know, because if you know what you are doing, you can do something great even in the smallest available project. So you have to, you have to just not give up and see the opportunity right. <laughs> all the time. Well, so, well, yeah. well, yeah. Well, Luba, you're an you perfect example of per perseverance. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I think so. I think so. <laughs> like, like you I definitely, think. definitely, I could definitely learn from you. Um, I so, must say that this is true. I don't know about talent, but I know that hard work and perseverance definitely are very important. Yeah. For sure, for sure. So yeah. you, yeah, you touched touched on this a little bit, you know, just a few minutes ago. But um, according to your website, your work reflects on quote complex issues because of your firmly held belief that art is central to the human experience existence, and that morality and creativity are aligned. Could you end quote? Could you expound on this statement? Yes, um, for me, um, morality and creativity go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, why? Because look, we are drowned in so much culture that provides entertainment, provides uh, ha 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 laugh, you know, fast changing pictures, trends, fashions, all the, you know, changing all the time. Everything has to be the newest, the latest, but very often all these uh, trends, uh, they're just so forgettable. They just pass and you don't even remember what it was because it does not touch you. You know, it does not give you that real message that we want of, of what art makes us feel, connection with other people or this um, kind of urge that we have to do something good, to feel empathy, to feel compassion for someone else. And to find answers because we face difficult situations all the time in our lives. And art is exactly, that's the purpose of it, to give us an answer. And that's where the morality comes. Creativity, yes, to be, everything has to have that moment of entertainment in it, in terms of, you know, art. But there should be that second layer where it gives you a message. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do with my work. Um, I hear very often from people, oh, that looks so beautiful and so that, but that, and I said to myself, well, I'm depicting all these really heavy, heavyweight issues that are not very beautiful, right? But the image, maybe the line, or maybe the message makes people feel uplifted a little bit. And maybe that gives them that feel that that's beautiful, you know, but, but yeah, that's, um, that's my theory about it, that, um, if you really want to, what you do as an artist to, to have any, to me, uh, long lasting effect on people, you have to give them some content. You don't have to just entertain, entertain them or surprise them or shock them or just some kind of meaningless provocativeness that we so often see in visual culture in terms of language, and in terms of um, presentation and all that. So, so yeah, um, and, and this picture, because I keep it on the screen for so long, um, I don't know if it's beautiful or not, but it's definitely truthful for what we are experiencing now. Uh, 
and it was done um, 2003, so almost, uh, what, 18 years ago, or almost, what, 19 years ago, mm -hmm. when uh, we were debating uh, the U.S. Um, involvement with Iraq, the Iraq, the beginning of the Iraq war, when uh, we knew that the, the back then the um, knowledge was that Saddam Hussein had the nuclear weapons, and then we started this war and it turned out that he did not have them. And that caused such a tragedy to, to we lost so many young people, both Americans and caused incredible tragedy in that whole region there. But now we are again in that same situation. What happened to our the diplomacy? How we couldn't prevent that? And this madman, Putin, he definitely has the nuclear weapons. So we just hope and pray that that this will end before something terrible happens, you know. But but seeing something that was done such a long time ago, and this another one that uh, that is also this isn't the the dialogue was not the answer was in the exhibition in the Freedom Center, and this one too. This I did when I saw a documentary about these young people, um, American soldiers who started coming from Iraq. And they were learning how to walk with the temporary prosthetic like that look like just like a cage upside down. So what is the price that we pay for these wars? Something else here about um, the privacy, our privacy. It was done um, again, I believe when uh, Bush, the George Bush was president and when they introduced this uh, Patriot Act that allowed the government to spy on ordinary Americans. So all kinds of questions and something here that is very also um, related closely to what we are seeing now because it was done uh, by invitation for in, in, in biennial art, uh, biennial art in uh, Ukraine uh, who asked me to do something um, on the Chernobyl disaster that they had. Um, and how, if you know from recent history, that um, reactor exploded and, and this um, radiation covered that whole region, you know. So, so I was listening to the news the other day, they already captured that, that site of this. And this event caused enormous suffering to the whole region. So, so yeah, um, with my work, that's, I think, an interesting um, aspect of it that I very often deal with um, subjects that cover completely different, sometimes regions of the world, or completely different um, aspects of what we are doing in our civilization and how, you know, we play some dangerous games sometimes. So, so I'm just like I said, I'm, I'm very much impacted by watching what's happening in Ukraine. And I really, really hope that, that this will end soon. And as, I don't know, something has to happen. Um, so, so yeah, this one also is in our exhibition at the Freedom Center. And it's about our debate. We, I know that we have some very passionate opinions nowadays about immigration, but still America is a land of immigrants, except for the Native Americans. And people come here from all over the world and uh, they contribute to the growth of this country. So that's why I did this person as a grafted tree, you know, showing that every one of us, no matter how we came here, we should find a way to contribute to the growth, not to, to something positive, you know? So that's, you know, I guess a helpful message of what is to be an immigrant. And this also about this stupidity of war that instead of spending our resources on educating young people, we throw them at these wars. So here the, the missile becomes a pencil sharpener. Yeah, something else, like a, another theme about this gentrification that we see in our big cities and in small cities too. And especially where I am in Long Island City in uh, New York, it used to be a great art community uh, with artists occupying 
some old industrial buildings, but at some point, the real estate developers, they liked very much that region and started building these gigantic condominium towers, very expensive. And they kicked out all of the artists from, from the area. And this is, again, the element of harmonica that kind of resembles a tall building. And, and the image is about uh, whether art can survive among these expensive but very boring looking glass towers that they're building in my area yeah so so that's that's something else that you can see in the show three images that address the women's rights in the muslim world and um, mm, this one shows i mean all of these three images show everyday situations in which women mm, cannot enjoy life simple things in, in life like, like a man would do. So eating ice cream, you cannot do that if you are covered completely with that uh, burka. Say, hey, hey, Luba, so let me do yeah. uh, one more question because mm -hmm. I know we're gonna, we wanna leave plenty of time for um, uh -huh. sure. uh, an answered questions. So um, mm -hmm. actually the two next two questions, you actually addressed them as you were going through each of the um, mm -hmm. um, um, images. But the last one I would like to ask, um, before we go into the question part of the uh, mm -hmm. uh, program is what are some quote unquote new social commentary work you would like to create in the future? Well, um, as you can see, uh, my work really addresses what's happening around us. So there are so many themes that uh, I can address um, that I just don't know even from where to start, you know. What interests me though is to find and uh, see the positivity among all this negative uh, uh, bombardment that we have, you know. So that really interests me because uh, uh, just the fact when you address something which is really like a um, traveling situation, just the fact that you address it, that in itself is a positive uh, thing, you know. But um, Mm, I still believe that because, because when you look back at the history, people have done terrible things to each other, but in the end, we see progress in society, right? We cannot deny it, but um, yeah, definitely want my message to be positive, but at the same time, to address what's happening without uh, any fear that um, you can be censored, you know, just to, to be truthful and honest and to try to reach people, you know. That's why I keep this language always, my visual language is, some people say deceptively simple, but I want to be easy to understand. So, so hopefully to inspire positive actions, you know, so that's what I want to do. And if you ask me what, what I really have done most, most recently, um, just last month, I completed, um, 11 new images for a book called America in 100 Charts. And it um, examines with different statistics uh, why things are the way they are in, in our society today. And this one, for example, it has a little bit of humor in it, but it um, talks about um, how these billionaires uh, build these rockets like Amazon and Bezos, and they fly these multimillionaires to enjoy the space for, for half an hour. And they build these weird shaped rockets. And, and then people wave at them, take pictures, but the infrastructure is falling apart. You know, the bridges, our bridges, our routes are falling apart. So, so it's an interesting, uh, project that I did and I, I cannot show more images, but that's just one, one of them, you know. Um, so yeah, so many issues that you can, you can tackle. I have um, also another project coming, which is my personal project. It's inspired by the blues and it's a series of 12 images and you have in the exhibition three of them, but the new ones I have never published or shown yet. So, so yeah. I do all kinds of things. In the end, I want my message to be about our shared humanity and that hope that, that we could do better than what we are doing now, okay? So this also is in the exhibition. And when I was doing the planning of this, the, the exhibition layout, 
this image you can see when you enter, you can see it on a yellow background. And you know, that's the hope that within our heart, something new and something positive can grow, you know? So, so yeah, that's, that's what I could say <laughs> <laughs> for what I want to do. Right. Uh, you know, possibilities right. are endless. Yeah. Right. That's awesome, Luba. Um, so we're going to go ahead and dive into some questions. I'm like, we got a lot of questions from the audience. So I'm going to start with the first one um, yeah. about the Broadway series, The Very Back Wall. Do you miss uh-huh. that work? What were your approach to Broadway? Oh, I don't miss it at all. And I keep doing it. And as a matter of fact, they're waiting for me now for a new piece oh. that I need to probably start working tonight, you know, after we finish. But no, I keep doing work for the theater. In that wall, though, you will see a bunch of works uh, with some great theater artists that I had. I've been like a really lucky to work with them like um, Ellen Stewart and the living Th- and the La Mama theater Judith Molina the living theater uh, these people um, the companies still exist but these two amazing theater directors they they passed away and they um, they left an amazing legacy but I was lucky to work with them for for a long time um, but no I still do that work I still do that work just we didn't have that much space in the gallery to show but i still do that right now i'm doing um new work for a company um which is also in the gallery uh, odyssey theater ensemble in los angeles it's a great company in los angeles so i'm doing new work for them right now so like i told you after we finish the talk i will go to to my desk and work a little bit on that no, I mean, I thought when when I um, included the theater work in the social commentary series that that will add another dimension to the whole exhibition because all of these theater productions, they they tackle also social issues, but like, like theater always anyway tackles social issues. But these to me were very interesting as uh, productions and I thought visually they complement the, the social commentary work. Yeah. So um, I have another question. Does this exp- exposition represent your complete body of work? Have you explored other types of art styles or other things in your professional career? Oh yeah, no, it does not. It does not explore. Uh, it's not absolutely not everything. Um, it's only what 54, 56 pieces that we have there. No, um, for example, um, one solid project that I did, uh, and I'm very you know, proud of it, is one um, publication, um, like a series of prints called Remembering the Women. And it was an interesting project because um, a publisher from Chicago asked me to, um, if I would be interested to visualize different stories from, uh, from the Bible where women play uh, important role and these stories are not very well known so um, that that became a very good well-selling publication for them and then they published it like a series of only of prints you know so now I've done so many other things and like like I told you that's not even all of this let's say social commentary work I've done um Initially, this exhibition started in Atlanta. And when I saw the layout of the gallery, I just figured out how much work I can fit in. But I think it's the right amount of work. In in the Freedom Center, I believe there are five or six new pieces that um, I shot for the first time um, in Cincinnati. But I think this is the right amount of work. You cannot make it much larger than that because it's, first of all, difficult to travel. And then it's a little too much for the viewer, you know, but now that by no means it's not everything I've done. No. Mm -hmm. Um, So so the next question will be, are you planning to exhibit your work in Europe anytime soon? um, If, if there is an opportunity, I would love to, you know, I must say that um, I've done exhibits here and there, mainly I think in Paris, you know, but um, other than that, oh yeah, I've done exhibition in Slovenia, um, tried to figure out where I've had um, like a bigger exhibitions, but 
uh, not as much as I've done, of course, in the US or in uh, um, Asia, you know, I've done exhibitions more than, than, than I've done in Europe, you know, but if there's an opportunity, absolutely, yeah, mm-hmm. I hope, I hope the situation will improve because in this uh, pandemic, everything was um, put on hold and I was able to mainly exhibit in the US, yeah, but hopefully, yeah, when things improve, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So, okay, next question, when you imagine an idea, do you quote unquote, see slash visualize the idea in your mind before you sketch it on paper? And then also do do your designs always include irony like the Dr. Martin Luther King does, the red poster? Um, uh, First of all, about the coming up with ideas, I do sketch for sure a lot, but I used to sketch much more when I was just starting, you know? And I think with the experience, you kind of don't need to sketch so much because you see it much faster in your head. Um, so, but I do sketch a lot, okay? Especially when, when I'm not sure how to something would look, I sketch and sketch and sketch until something clicks and that's it. But like I said, that process of uh, searching for the right shape was much longer when I was just starting in this field. And then in terms of irony, Um, Yes, irony, I would say like a metaphor. I think that's a good way to present a very serious and very um, sometimes difficult topic because if you present it in this way when there is, I wouldn't say humor, but even in some pieces you might say there is humor, but if there is this metaphoric twist that makes it more interesting for the viewer or the viewer kind of feel that they discover it by themselves, you know? Mm -hmm. Because everybody knows I have a dream, right? Everybody knows who is Dr. King and what he did, but how to present it in a way which is not cliche, which seems like new for the people, which will probably trigger their interest if they don't know to learn more. So that's, I think, when using this um, unusual way when you approach a well-known team um, brings that interest that you want to inspire in people, yeah. Mm -hmm. So next question is, what role does color play in your work? What inspire you to create this palette for designing justice? What words define your palette? Uh, Well, um, these prints uh, being, meant to, many of them were actually posters that were meant to be in a public space, okay? Because I wouldn't say that all of them are like that because many of them are just pieces for the gallery. But for those of, uh, of the images that were really used on the street, you definitely have to use these bright, vibrant colors so these images can be seen from a distance, you know, which is the nature of poster art to grab people's attention from, uh, from a distance. And... Uh, I kind of like this um, um, vibrant, bright color palette uh, because again, um, just the color itself brings something positive and and uplifting and then kind of makes it abstract, you know, like this picture that, uh, for example, the black silhouette with the green, you know, I mean, the the color, in in nature, you don't see these colors, you know, nothing is that green or that black, you know, but but when you use this high contrast that brings the attention and grabs the eye and hopefully makes you take a second look. So, So yeah, the colors also, I don't use them randomly in a way. Um, I like to use the black color uh, because it gives structure to the image and just the silhouettes and the lines kind of get even that more of a pronounced uh, look maybe, especially when the line has some fluid, nice quality, the high contrast kind of emphasizes that. So I love that. But then every time when I use color, the color kind of complements the meaning a little bit, okay? It's not just because I just think, why not try to do it blue or blue, or do it green. It always kind of helps the message a little bit. Yeah. Have you ever thought to create animation? 
I, I have done a little bit of that to, in a small scale, you know, never thought, never had the opportunity to think of a big project where I could tell a longer story with images that move. But in this simple form, with like a GIF when you can easily start make an image moving, I, I've played with that just for fun. But I've never, I've never thought about doing something really um, that tells a story in time, you know, because when you look at the still image, the story is within that simple picture. But if animation allows you to tell a longer story in time, that's an interesting idea too, but I haven't had the opportunity to do something like that yet, no. But, uh, but I've played with moving with my images. Yes, I've done that. Um, I'm sorry, going through these. these um, I think that Oh, you know, um, I think you touched on it a little bit regarding um, um, from a Pratt colleague who always, who has always enjoyed your work. What is your views on the Ukraine situation? Are you creating some work in response to this moment? I think you touched on it a little bit, but you can go ahead and kind of, you know, re yeah. re revisit that. Well, I have to say that I know so many artists from Ukraine because I told you I've been there and um and they mm, just unbelievable you know i will definitely do something but but this for example the piece about chernobyl that was done for ukraine uh, you just if you read the story of this country and these people first of all they are such a great example of what is really to love your country and to be willing to give your life in the 21st century because when we read history about all these heroes who just threw themselves in fight and lost their lives very young, you think, oh, that's in the past, but now it's happening in front of us. So they're an incredible example of, of loving your country. And Ukraine, remember they were saying, oh, it's a corrupt country. The politicians are corrupt. We have corruption here too, but people love their country and they're willing to, um, to sacrifice everything about it. So to me, that's very, very inspiring. And maybe a little bit of an example for, for us too, to cherish the freedom that we have in America. America is not perfect by no means. We have very serious issues, but it's a great country, okay? And we have to learn to unite and to cherish what we have because we can very easily lose it, okay? So Ukraine is a perfect example of that. It was not a perfect country. They had a lot of issues, but when this war came to them without any reason, look what they're doing, you know? It's just so, so inspirational and so just makes you rethink everything about, about life in a way, what we are witnessing with them. So, so definitely, definitely we'll do something also, not only professionally that I know, um, um, friends there who are just I'm afraid to to check what their face, Facebook page what's happening or just to turn the news I hope they're all safe I hope this nightmare something miraculous will happen but I don't expect from this Putin he's a crazy man but yes they they deserve our support and admiration and we can learn something from them okay because they had their peaceful life they knew that something bad is brewing but nobody imagined that, okay? And same is true about us, okay? We are a, here, we are a big country. We think that we are very strong, but it's not so. The world is interconnected and we should learn to live together and to protect the great things we have and to, to deal with the problems together, okay? And to be really smart how we deal with, with these evil powers in the world because they exist, okay? So yeah, that's that's my lesson. I, I mean, lesson. I don't know what to say. I'm I'm just overwhelmed with so many thoughts about this situation. So, but first and foremost, I wish them well, and I wish this nightmare to be over as soon as possible. You know. Yeah, def most definitely. It breaks my heart seeing those images on yeah. television and on my, you know, scrolling through my phone or whatnot. So I hope you know it, it just resolves very soon. Um, <laughs> next question is. How do you decide how many prints per piece to sell? How do you think about the business side of your incredible art? 
Hmm. Well, the large prints, um, I do them in limited edition, really like 10, not 15 pieces, you know. Um, just first of all, because they're expensive to make and they're very large, you know, so I don't do more than that. But um, I publish um, smaller size prints that are very inexpensive in that um, portfolio size pieces, like say 11 by 17, um, 14 by 20 I've published, 11 by 14, something that you can easily frame and use in your home because not everybody have the space in their homes to put something that large, you know? And uh, so this I do, and this I think is a good addition to, you know, to everything else I do, especially because I get a lot of requests from, from younger people who, who just love the work, but they say, oh, I cannot afford, I don't have the space for a large print. But so that gave me the idea to, to offer my work in this smaller size sets where people can buy multiple prints and display them together and individually. And I think that that works well, but it's not a big business. It's kind of rather supporting the other stuff I do, you know, so yeah, but the larger prints are in a limited edition, mm, very limited. Okay, mm. I love this, um, the second part of this question. So how did you discover or decide upon your very distinct visual style and any advice for young artists still trying to discover their style? I love that question. <laughs> I think it's a very good question because I've struggled with that myself too. Not that I've struggled, but um, the finding a style, first of all, should not be a goal. You know, you should be truthful to your message, what you want to say. And I think if a style emerges after some years of work, that's great. But you shouldn't be forced on anybody. You should come naturally. For me, this came exactly like that after years of working and after also seeing what people react to. And uh, in some occasions, it's also because of the limitations of the medium that I sometimes had to do something only with two or three colors or just do it for a specific think like a poster where it needs to be very simple and very easy to see. But these limitations in a way were something that I liked because I think when you manage to express um, an interesting idea with less, that makes it even more powerful, okay? So all these elements some, somehow maybe from limitations and sometimes from clearly seeing the impact of the work increasing when I do it with less. So that kind of enforced that. And then I've always had this interest in, in human form, in drawing human forms in my works, because I think um, that also makes them more interesting for people because we like to see humanity, ourselves basically. Right. So then yes, then when you draw more, you know, you see when I draw a figure, I will not draw everything about that figure, okay? I will keep only the most expressive elements and I will just chisel out what doesn't help, you know? So so this is like really part of this process when you finish something and when you realize that I don't need this, I can add that or I can exaggerate this and I, or I can, um, you know, completely crop something that doesn't work. So that in a way, comes with experience and eventually people start calling it a style but it's not like a formula that you apply from piece to piece it's every time you make a different decision but but definitely I would advise not to stress too much about your own style because people react to your message first if you just come up with some stylish work you see we that's exactly about what I was saying about the trends the trends come and go the styles come and go but when you say something that touches somebody's heart, that's strong, bigger than the style. But if you work long enough, and if you like particular things about, like say drawing people or drawing other things, maybe that will become a style for you that, and people will recognize you for that. But it shouldn't be only the style. The first and foremost should be the message, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. I'm gonna, um end it with this last question um so are there so and then wrap up 
um, are there subjects you intentionally invo- avoid or things that you are afraid to do? I love this question too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying not to avoid anything, okay? Um, no, um, I, I wouldn't say that, okay? We, we live in a free world where um, we can do whatever we want. It's rather my decision of, do I really want to send a message that um, will make feel people feel helpless or feel depressed, you know. Uh, To me, me, that's the balance always. Uh, By depicting something which is not very cheerful, how to make it um, not depressing, okay? (laughs) So color helps in that. Uh, And all of kinds of considerations that I have, you know, but um, fear has never been one of those, you know never since a very young age um i know that we live now in a time where there are a lot of things happening that deserve to be addressed and um, this exhibition like i said started um in 2017 where that was what i came up with there since then there are many other issues that deserve to be addressed And probably that will become another exhibition. I don't know how it's gonna be called, but what you can expect from me is always the same thing, that I want to address the issue, but I don't want people to feel like it's not within our reach to fix it, okay? So I want always to have this this element of uh, positivity in the end, you know? So I'm sorry, this is the very last question. It's a short, uh, you know, it requires just a short, answer is your work still at moma in in new york city oh yeah yeah Uh that's it used to be uh, they kept it on display in 2014 for one year but then they that's how they do they rotate the works so yeah i don't think if you go there you can see it now but it used to be on display for a whole year yeah okay so luba is there anything you would like to um say in closing (laughs) In closing, I just want to thank the entire National Underground Railroad Freedom Center for hosting my work, for all these great people that I met there. I will be coming um, once more (laughs) just to take some more pictures and then we can come down to take down the show. But gosh, what can I say? No, thank you. And thank you to everybody who came. And um, I wish everybody to, to do what they love doing and to be absolutely, if you, if you just follow your passion, I'm sure you can go somewhere with it. It's always like that, yeah. Right, well, on behalf of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center, um, I um, thank everybody who um, came um, to see Luba talk. Um, y'all had, y'all had some really great questions. Um, I just, some of the questions I wouldn't even think of. So, um, <laughs> it, it's like, it's like, you got it, you know, you got a, um, a, um, a fan club, Luba. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank and you. So, and so, um, on be, again, on behalf of the Freedom Center, um, my name is Jack, Dr. Jacqueline Hudson and, um, uh, wish you all a great night. And, um, I'd like in the chat, um, seven to 10 days, um, you'll, we'll have this, um, video up for, um, for next, um, for viewing, um, at a later time, or you can direct somebody who was wanted to come or missed it. And you can direct them to that website. So to that link to the website. So thank you. And good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. everyone. Bye. Bye.